Welcome. Welcome to the Gandal Hall of the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra. Uh, I um, want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay our respects to their elders past and present. Welcome particularly to Canberra. Canberra is, I don't know if you know Joe, is a monument to what can be achieved by Midwestern idealism matched with Australian leadership. So it's, um, uh, so it's a real, uh, really great uh, place for us to be hosting this conversation. Um, I want to first of all tell you a little bit about our format and then introduce our speakers and begin. Uh, first of all, if you can bring yourself to turn off your phone, I know it's painful, but, um, but now's, now's, the, now's the opportunity. Um, so that's the first thing to let you know. Secondly, we're going to begin with a bit of a conversation between Joe and myself and Chris, talk for as long as it takes us to bore ourselves, I suppose, a bit about growth and inequality and then try to bring you all in. Uh, and uh, then we'll have a bit of an opportunity um, for a cup of coffee and, uh, and a handshake um, and uh, possibly even a photograph if you're able to turn your phone back on in time. So, um, so welcome all. Let me begin by acknowledging Joe, uh, a Nobel laureate, a professor of economics at Columbia University. We're tremendously uh, glad to see you here in Australia yeah, um, carrying the argument and tremendously glad to see you here at the Chifley Research Centre. It's uh, yeah. a real honour you do us with your presence. Um, I know you're in Canberra for a few days and in Australia for only a short time. So we're, we, couldn't sure. be, we couldn't be happy to have you. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to also acknowledge Chris Bowen, MP, our Shadow Treasurer, carrying the argument for Labor on the economic side. Um, doing a great job at a really difficult time. Um, but uh, here we are in the first year of opposition and um, the budget's probably made our job a little bit easier, but it doesn't, <laughs> but it doesn't do it for us. So someone's got to carry the case. So thanks for, thanks thanks for being here with us, Chris. And uh, Chris is quite engaged with our work and does some terrific things. So we're really grateful for your continued engagement. Should acknowledge Senator Penny Wong, good friend, Jenny Macklin, MP, uh, Tim Watts, MP, really glad to have you here. Um, should also make a special acknowledgement of Australia's crumbling transport infrastructure, which has uh, delayed uh, our former Deputy Prime Minister and Treasurer Wayne Swan, who will be here. He's got a seat. <laughs> Jenny's holding the spot for him, so we're looking forward to seeing Wayne shortly. And uh, I know he's looking forward to being here. Um, I should also acknowledge our Chifley Chair, Nick Martin, and members of our board, and all of you friends and uh, guests of the Chifley Research Centre. So look, thank you so much for being here, uh, Joe, and uh, welcome. I was hoping you could begin by telling me about Gary, Indiana. So uh, the reason he's mentioned Gary, Indiana is that's where I uh, grew up. Uh, I was born in Gary and grew up. Uh, and in a way, Gary, Indiana is really interesting because it reflects the uh, rise and fall of the industrial sector in the United States. Uh, it's uh, a steel town on the southern shore of Lake Michigan, in the Midwest. Uh, it was founded in 1906 as, by U.S. Steel. It's the largest integrated steel mill in the world. Uh, it was named after, and there aren't many cities that have this distinction, named after the chairman of the board of U.S. Steel. <laughs> and uh, it was totally a, a, a company town. Uh, as a company town in the early part of the 20th century, it did some things right. It had, it, had, uh, it started with uh, a, a very good school system uh, that was very much influenced by John Dewey and, and his ideas uh, called work, study, play. We all had to learn, learn two crafts because uh, the assumption was that, that everybody had to have skills. So, so uh, um, I learned how to be a printer. My brother learned how to be a, a metal worker. So it was a very industrial city. I said it reflected the rise and fall of uh, manufacturing. Um, I was there, I, I grew up in the, in the uh, I was born in 43, so I grew up in the late 40s, 50s there. And that was the peak, the population was around 200,000. It's, it's, it's about 30, 40 miles from, from uh, Chicago. And any of you uh, who you would drive from the East Coast to Chicago would go by Gary, because you had to go by Gary. And uh, you got a, a wonderful display of uh, the Aura Borealis, you know, the, the Northern Lights. Except it wasn't the Aura Borealis, it was pollution uh, from the steel mill going into the air. And I, I hate to look at my lungs uh, to see what, when I die what they look like, because they must be coated with soot and, and, and dirt. Uh, it was, uh, you know, you not only the largest steel producer, it's probably the largest polluter uh, in the world. And, you know, just 
poured out iron ore and, and you know, everything. But anyway, um, Gary is, is uh, now, uh, when I go back to visit, it, it doesn't good as much. Um, <laughs> you can say that's because it's no longer mm. producing. But it's actually not true. It produces as much steel as it did at its peak, but without any workers. Uh, so, with, with that more accurately, about uh, less than a sixth of the number of workers. The result of that is Gary is a ghost town. And you go back, I did a little film about uh, globalization uh, for the French German um, uh, TV uh, called RT. And, and uh, it begins in Gary because it was, uh, in a way, illustrates. Uh, the m multiple sides of globalization. So we couldn't, com we, we, we couldn't really compete with China except by making mass-produced, low-quality steel. We didn't go the German route of making specialized steel. We made really low-quality uh, steel. Uh, because the United States uh, didn't believe in industrial policies, we said, OK, let the city rot. <laughs> so if you go there, it looks like uh, a war zone. And in fact, one of the small industries, they were a little bit of proud when I, when I went there about, uh, about this, is they make movies. Uh, there have been two or three movies made there where uh, you want to show the fighting like in Somaliland. And it's too dangerous to go to Somali but you want to see what a war zone looks like. Gary looks like right. a, a war zone. So they okay. make war movies there because it looks totally destroyed. Uh, I hope I give you a picture so, of how bad things are. You're saying dystopia is a future growth industry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, the one part, our neighboring town, one part of uh, the steel industry, a small part, not Gary, but the next hour, East Chicago, was saved because uh, the steel mill was bought by Mattal, which is an Indian steel producer. So globalization destroyeth and it also saveth. Uh, so it saved a small part of the industry by buying it. You would have thought that uh, America Enterprise would be able to figure out a way to save the steel industry, but the answer was no, uh, because we were more, our industry was more uh, work concentrated on how to extract as much profits for the shareholders as quickly as possible and for the CEOs even more quickly and not reinvest in the country. So we had a steel industry that did not reinvest and so the city was left basically to die, not to be reinvented. And any of you who follow what's been happening to Detroit, there's some wonderful pictures that have been on the news about, about wonderful about what happens to a major American metropolis, a million people, when you let it go to the seed. The one thing is that there is an inkling of the beginning of a revival in Detroit, because you can buy a home that would have been a million dollars for $10,000. So there's a lot of poor people uh, a lot of artists who've decided that, <laughs> that they are poor, but, but uh, the people who, who, who say, well, it doesn't matter where I live, uh, I can buy a nice house for $10,000, and the, the, they, they've moved to Detroit. So it was the beginning of a little, when you really hit bottom, you can... Uh, uh, Somewhere back. Yeah. But the real, the, the real thing about Gary is that it, it illustrates what happens in the absence of industrial policies. To, and when I say industrial, I mean policies to try to, to restructure the economy at an enormous cost to society. Now, my own, um, uh, Gary, growing up in Gary had a lot of influence on me in a number of ways because uh, as I was growing up, you could see there, there, a lot of uh, African Americans. Uh, we had very bad discrimination, a lot of poverty, um, really serious poverty, uh, episodic uh, unemployment, business cycle was in its heyday, going up and down. And it had a lot of uh, influence on, on me, I think, because when I went to graduate school 
And I studied these economics textbooks that s said how wonderful the market economy was. And there were people like Gary Becker, I don't know if you know, who said that markets make sure that discrimination didn't exist. Uh, I became convinced that these guys uh, <laughs> were totally out of touch with reality. And that, uh, as I put it in one of my lectures, you know, it was a, uh, the result that they proved that the market was efficient, and this was the best of all possible worlds. Uh, my reaction is, this was the best possible world. I wanted to live in another world. And uh, the view that in another world was possible, and, and that's what I've been working on since. Chris, you're from another world, as it were, a, a, a also a crossroads of globalisation, and you came to maturity in the period of huge economic and social change in Sydney's West. Tell us about that. And, it's obviously a different story, but a related story in a way. Yeah, so um, I grew up and still live in Smithfield, which is named after Smithfield, London, because it was the market town of early Sydney. And I guess in a lesson about what uh, government decisions can mean for places, Smithfield was the centre of Western Sydney, and then a decision was taken to send the railway line to Parramatta, not Smithfield, and the rest is history. People here have heard of Parramatta, they've not heard, even, even Joseph might have heard of Parramatta, but he hasn't heard of Smithfield, I'm quite sure. Um, but it has led to a very different um, community. It is um, arguably, depending on how you use your metrics, the most multicultural community in Australia. Uh, in my electorate, 51% um, of people uh, born overseas and speak a, and, and a and very high proportion speak a language other than English at home. And we have the largest industrial estate in the Southern Hemisphere, Smithfield Weddell Park, the largest industrial conglomeration in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, yet we still have very high unemployment and particularly high youth unemployment. Always have uh, had higher youth unemployment than the national average. We sit, I, I live literally 100 metres from a factory, which is the start of the Smithfield Weddell Park industrial conglomeration. So there's a huge disconnect, which is partly related to our multicultural uh, makeup and the and the uh, difficulty in uh, attaching migrants to skills and jobs and refugees in particular, a very high refugee intake in my community to skills and jobs, uh, but a high degree of um, uh, services as well and 24-hour operation. Um, there's, I mean, if I get woken up in the middle of the night, it's the it's the it's not the kids usually. It's the sirens going at the factories, signalling shift change. Uh, and um, that's the environment I grew up. My dad worked in um, worked for the NRMA, which is also based in that industrial est estate, which is for non-New South Wales people, the, the automobile club for New South Wales, the mechanics. He um, was a uh, permanent midnight shift, so he would work uh, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. every day uh, at the NRMA, making, of course, people's cars break down in the middle of the night as well. So he would come home at seven um, as I was getting ready for school. He'd have a scotch to get himself off to sleep. Uh, the, the smell of scotch and milk, as I had my wheat picks, <laughs> stays with you for the rest life of your life. Uh, uh, so um, uh, you know, that's uh, how he mm. relaxed as he came home in the morning, because he needed to get to sleep through all the noise of the, of the day going on around him, so he could be ready to go back to work mm. at um, 11 o'clock at night. But our industrial estate has obviously got its huge challenges. but. Um, there is a fair degree of innovation, a lot of high-tech jobs, and people talk about high-tech manufacturing, but it's not making high-tech things necessarily. It's doing things in a high-tech way, and that has its pluses and its minuses, as, as I think Joseph was implying, that um, obviously it means the factories are still there, but, but the number of people employed in them has, has fallen dramatically, and I suppose we might get onto that, but you know, the, the, I wonder whether this is the start of the of what Jared Bernstein calls the, the jaw, jaws of the snake, where productivity for the first time is going up, but employment's not going up with it, and what public policy challenges that provides for us all. So, I'm hearing in a way you're both talking about places where growth has been a key determinant, but at the same time, growth hasn't been enough. Not that growth is necessary, but obviously not sufficient. But just before we get further into that, what, what else there is apart from growth, I'm interested in hearing a bit from you both about prospects for growth in coming years. There's some barriers and some policies that we need to pursue, but clearly part of the story of the last five or 10 years has been this sledgehammer to economic growth first. What, what, is it getting any better? Is there any cause for, for so optimism? I, 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 I think you, you need to think about these on two sides, the demand mm -hmm. side and the supply side, the uh, demand side and the productivity side. And so 
The, the main problem since the 2008 crisis, and even before, I would argue, has to do with the demand side. Uh, it's really an old-fashioned Keynesian problem of lack of <coughs> aggregate demand uh, in most countries around the world. China is very different, and you, you've been benefiting from the spillovers from China, but in, you know, called the North Atlantic, Europe and the United States, real problems of lack of aggregate demand leading to, uh, you know, most of the European countries today have a per capita income uh, adjusted for inflation lower than it was 2008. And uh, it's, it's been a lost half decade, and it looks like it'll probably be five years before they get back to where they were, and let alone no prospect of catching up where they would have been but for the crisis. So just getting back to, and even Germany, which claims to be a success story, has grown on a per capita adjusted for inflation basis of under 1%, which you would normally say is a D minus performance. You know, and the bottom 30% of Germany has seen a decline. So you gotta say this is really uh, not very good. Just to give you one number to show you how bad American economy, because America thinks of itself as doing better than Europe, median income in the United States, median household income, half above, half below, in the United States, is now lower than it was a quarter century ago. And median income, if you look at various groups we are talking about industrialization, median income of a full-time male worker in the United States is lower than it was 40 years ago. Minimum wage, people at the bottom have wages basically lower than they were a half century ago. So this is a, you know, sort of, if you want a picture of how the market economy in, quote, the best performing economy in the world is work, it's not working for most people. Bill Gates is doing very well, by the way. But <laughs> that's, uh, that's, you know, it's nice to know that somebody's, somebody's doing well, and uh, the people who engage, uh, you know, the, the, the guy who owns the gambling casinos in Macau is doing very well. And, you know, so there's some place that people are doing well. But in terms of most Americans, uh, not, the American economy has not, has not been performing uh, and not likely to uh, begin performing for some time. Uh, now, that's important to realize because a lot of the debate is on, in other countries is how to make their economy like America. <laughs> and uh, I think it really is important to understand that for most people, the American economy hasn't been working. And so you want to try to understand why has the American economy been failing and make sure that you don't make the same mistakes that the United States uh, has made. It feels like we're starting to enter a phase like that or entering now a phase mm -hmm. like that in Australian politics and debate where there is this pressure to, uh, to pursue approaches which, as you say, look to have failed. We've obviously had a pretty relatively speaking, a, a good crisis, as it were, a good five years, uh, six years. Um, but as Chris can probably say, we're now entering a period of risk, both on the demand side and through policy. Yeah, that's right. And that's why I, I think it's important. You know, there's this ideology that markets are the way to deliver. And the more unfettered the market, the better. And I think it's important to remember, you know, America had pretty unfettered markets. And this is what it's delivered for most people. And uh, the answer is it really hasn't delivered. Uh, yeah. So Chris, this is a, it strikes me this argument that Joe's making with a fair bit of force is obviously a really sharp challenge to uh, the Ameri call it American capitalism. Mm. Um, but I suppose we probably feel like we've got a different model here, at mm. least in part. Yeah, to what extent do you think it's a challenge to the way we've done business in Australia? We're hearing a critique of liberal markets, which, um, which can be positioned in different ways depending on whether it's applied to the Australian model, the American model, and others. Mm. How much do we have to learn from this? Do you think? Well, I mean, I think our, obviously the context is different, but the the principles are the same uh, around the world or around the developed capitalist world. Uh, in Australia, I would have thought um, we have some things to point to as being uh, achievements. Uh, and some things to be worried about for the future. So has inequality increased in Australia? Yes. Um, do we have the most targeted, most effective welfare system in the world? I would say yes, probably. 
uh, the fact that we can have a relatively low tax base and yet have a welfare system, which is the, we're the means testing capital of the world. Personally, I think that's appropriate uh, because it means that we are focusing our, our redistributive efforts in a quite a targeted fashion. And of course, importantly, our industrial relations um, mm. uh, regime, uh, which has been you know, ever since the harvester judgment, and it's been, it's, it's been obviously pushed and pulled in various directions. Um, but I was fascinated, to, Joseph, to read the IMF just last week recommend an increase in the minimum wage in the United States, which I thought was, was a very, I mean, those well-known socialists down at the IMF yes. uh, <laughs> saying that the minimum wage yes. should be boosted to try and boost consumption. And I thought, well, that's probably quite, quite a dramatic development in, um, in the scale of this debate that you're referring to, Michael, uh, and reflects <coughs> We have our minimum wage arguments in Australia mm. too, but you know, they're, they're nowhere near as fraught as those in the United States because we have had the minimum wage more, more or less keep up um, compared to the United States. In fact, the IMF felt obliged to enter into that debate and say we need to stimulate demand, and okay, that's one thing to say, but we should stimulate demand by giving people more money in their wages. Mm. I thought it was, a, was quite a dramatic development in this debate. Yeah, let me just emphasize that that there's been a real major change in economic thinking on, on these issues. The IMF has been very strong, very effective in pointing out, in a way that I pointed out also in my book, The Price of Inequality, that today inequality is a major impediment to economic growth, economic efficiency, economic stability. And the IMF has taken up the, the call to try to say, you know, and I've heard Christine Lagarde talk in China, talk in the United States, mm. you really have to reduce these extremes of inequality. So, ex and, and so this is based on the best economic research, and it's very difficult for somebody in the opposition to say, I mean, somebody in the government, current <laughs> government, but, yeah, saw it. <laughs> <laughs> to say really inequality is a good thing, or that if you push an equality agenda, it would hamper economic growth. That you know, used to be we thought of there being a trade-off. And now, very strong view that there are a wide set of instruments by which we could increase equality and increase economic growth, including increasing minimum wage. Australia's uh, minimum wage played a role, important role in, in the US debate, because our minimum wage is half that of Australia. And to say that you know, uh, minimum wa high minimum wages mean you're going to have high unemployment, uh, we say, you know, look at Australia. Uh, why can they have a minimum wage that's twice that of the United States, a and we can't? Hmm. And that's been an important, important part of the argument. And, and you, you've really set a, a good example there, uh, as in, 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 in several other uh, areas. But before you get too complacent, uh, you should, <laughs> All right. uh, in terms of your after tax and transfer uh, measure of inequality, a standard measure of Gini, uh, Gini coefficient, uh, it's about twice that of Denmark. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there's a lot of room mm -hmm. for improvement. I mean, I don't think that, that Australia should, should feel that it's really doing well. You're doing better than the United States. You could be doing worse. But uh, uh, that's, not a, that's not a benchmark. You know, I don't think you should set the United States as your benchmark. I, I think you really should say set, set the Scandinavian countries, which in terms of most measures of societal well-being have been doing so much better in terms of growth, in terms of, and at the same time have been able to um, uh, uh, reduce inequality. So, do, so, so a D minus isn't really the, the goal. Yeah, we don't want to do, just do better than a D minus. And there's yeah. one other aspect that's important, uh, an important aspect of, of uh, that's, I think, is probably st much stronger in Australia than in the United States, but important to keep, and and again is under threat right now, which is equality of opportunity. We've talked about equality of outcomes and the, the numbers of the income inequality, wealth inequality. One of the Ways, you know, U.S. has the highest level of income inequality. The level of wealth inequality is even worse. Mm. Uh, the the uh, top one percent has about thirty to forty percent of all the wealth, and um, 
vax uh, health inequality in the United States is probably the worst of the vax countries, and that's because we have a private-based healthcare mm -hmm. system, and Australia has a reputation of both having a good healthcare system, relatively relative equality, and low cost. We spend, I think, twice mm, it is. Yeah. twice what you do with outcomes that are comparable to a developing country. So if you want to get a system where rent seeking plays a large role in the healthcare sector, move towards the American uh, okay. uh, system where you'll get lower outcomes with spending more money. And uh, some of the discussion going on here seems to be a desire by some people to move in that direction. And if you're one of the rank seekers, I totally understand that. <laughs> um, but why the rest of society should support this kind of rank seeking mm. behavior, I don't understand. But one of the, mo the most disturbing aspect of American inequality is the lack of equality of opportunity. Mm. I, and I, I was just going to say, I might want to, this is an interesting point which we've been talking a bit about with Jenny Macklin. Um, and I might want to bring Jenny in on this point about the modernization of redistributive systems, social insurance, and, and for that matter, pre-distribution, education, and so on, whether we've kept pace with the pace of economic change on the, on the market side in Australia since the 1980s, whether there's a modernization challenge there. Now, I'm just gonna ask, where's our roving mic? Okay, while well, you're getting that, let oh, me just yeah, mention yeah. the fact the United States you know, likes to yeah, think of itself yeah. as the American dream. Mm. And we now know it's a myth that the life prospects of a young American are more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in other advanced countries. And it's mainly because of the education system. And one of your, your, your uh, important parts of this is your way of financing higher education. Uh, for which Bruce Chapman over there was an important contributor in income contingent loans. Uh, really important, and that uh, things are getting worse in the United States, mm. not better. So we've had, we've had innovations in health and education, but I'm, I just want to bring Jenny in on this particular point about innovations in, in the sort of welfare and, and other payment side. Thanks very much, and uh, thanks for joining us here today. Uh, I just wanted to join together the comment you made about your hometown and the cost of uh, its demise. Uh, and some of the other uh, points you've been making in your writing about how to actually measure the social and e economic costs of these uh, huge changes. So in Australia uh, just today, it's the first anniversary of a huge reform we put in place, the new National Disability Insurance Scheme, a new system of insurance to cover people with severe disabilities over their lifetimes. And when we had the Productivity Commission do the inquiry into how this scheme should work, they did some analysis for us of the economic benefits of such an insurance approach. Uh, but what we've always found very difficult to measure and p particularly difficult to uh, get agreement about with um, uh, traditional um, economic thinking, maybe if I could put it that way, is, um, is how to actually demonstrate the social and economic benefit of such investments. Uh, I think we've failed for the sort of town or city that you came from, but we also are unable to uh, describe the benefit to society other than in the broadest terms. And so the current neoliberal approach is, well, this is going to cost us $14 billion. That's a cost to society. And we don't have a very effective way of coming back and saying, well, these, in fact, are the economic benefits. Uh, uh, what would be your uh, advice about how to um, better pursue that? argument. Okay, so <clears throat> part of the way uh, I would begin the discussion is to first note that GDP is not a good measure of Precisely. economic yeah. performance. And there, there's, uh, and this is now well accepted. I, I chaired this International Commission 
on the measurement of economic performance and social progress. We have a report called Mismeasuring Our Lives, Why GDP Doesn't Add Up. Uh, and it, it, you know, the raw, there was unanimity that GDP, not only GDP was not a good measure, but what were the things that were wrong setting a research agenda that's now been taken up by the OECD. And there's now a, a, a high level uh, expert group that, which I chair that is trying to push this agenda uh, further. Uh, if we could get more financial support, we'd be able to do it more. Uh, but but the, the, uh, there are many aspects of, of why GDP is not a good measure. It doesn't measure what happens to resource depletion if your growth is based on taking wealth away from underground and you don't reinvest it above the ground, you're poor. So it doesn't measure economic sustainability. Uh, it doesn't um, measure, uh, it, uh, it doesn't, so there are lots of things that are not incorporated. One thing that it doesn't measure that is very important uh, is security. And lots of studies illustrate how important security is. At the World Bank, we did a study when I was chief economist on the voices of the poor, where we talked about what was it that made people uh, suffer the most of being at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And obviously, lack of income was important. Mm -hmm. But so was insecurity and lack of voice. Those were the three things that kept coming up. We interviewed 10,000 people, kept coming up over and over again. Now, the good thing is that's one aspect that we know how to quantify well. We know how to quantify the, the cost of insecurity. And so one of the things that we're trying to do, uh, part of the agenda going forward, is to include a measures of insecurity as, as a real economic benefit. I mean, after all, you think of the whole insurance industry, what is that whole industry about? It's a measure of the people are willing to spend lots of money to inefficient private insurance companies to get more, more security. So there's no, no doubt that people value security. We can actually quantify how much they value. The fact that we, when we provide it publicly, we don't incorporate that benefit in GDP is a mistake of our measurement system. It's not, if we don't measure it, doesn't mean it's not there. It's a real benefit. And I think we ought to be using, you know, trying to move towards expanded metrics of well-being, which would include the value of security. And so, for instance, my view is when we try to privatize old age pension in the United States, to leave people on the, uh, dependent on the market, that was increasing insecurity. And that was a lowering of standards of living. And you know, we were grateful that Bush failed. Had he succeeded, the crisis of 2009, eight, would have been much worse because people's total uh, uh, retirement income would have been wiped out. And we, the, the number of people in poverty in the United States would have soared. Everybody over, over 65 would have been put into poverty if we had privatized Social Security in the way that Bush had wanted. So there's a, there's a personal level of economic security at stake in, in some of these changes. And there's also a system-wide stability, a sort of a, a cost to, so a, what we're hearing in this kind of, uh, even if it is growing, it's unbalanced growth. We're getting That's both right. individuals are feeling the lack of security and then there's a kind of a, a, a globalised or national or, or, or countrywide instability. This might be a point I'd be interested in bringing you in on Wayne is, you know, this, the, what I think you've spoken to us about a bit, chiefly, is the inclusive growth agenda, um, which obviously has these benefits of delivering income to individuals, but also I'm interested in your thoughts of whether inclusive growth is going to be actually more sta secure for those individuals and more stable. Well, I think the thing that really stands out to me, particularly as I've been talking to people internationally about this debate in Australia and what's really different here, say, from the United States or Great Britain for that matter, I think is industrial relations. And if you talk about security, there's nothing more fundamental than A, getting a job, and then B, having the capacity to keep that job under decent working conditions. And whilst it's, 
it's true that we've done very well in terms of universal health and education as a driver of long-term social mobility. What really stands out to me is that we've kept the gains in our economic growth largely uh, with the middle and lower income earners over the last few years. Yes, there's been a concentration at the top, but amongst lower and middle income earners, most of our growth has been spread pretty even evenly across them. And the factor that distinguishes us, say, from elsewhere in the world is not just the number of jobs created during a difficult period, but the fact that the benefit of that has been shared pretty widely, I think, through a decent minimum wage and also through good collective bargaining arrangements. And that's why I think this debate internationally is m missing something. Uh, the Brits are concentrating particularly on uh, opportunities in health and education and regulating power prices and issues like that. But I think what's missing there and perhaps missing in the wider debate around the world is collective bargaining power and a decent minimum wage. And I've got to say I'm really surprised when I go to conferences with bankers and they're talking about you know, problems in terms of demand for credit. Even bankers are standing up and saying, well, what do you expect if uh, millions of people are on a, you know, a, a wage that's so low they don't have the capacity to buy a house? So I think from what's going on in Australia, the thing that really stands out, apart from the obvious things, is our industrial relations system, which we've been able to hold in place. And I guess that explains why there's such a backlash against it and why vested interests here, their number one aim isn't just to dismantle universal and quality health and education, it's to rip out the industrial relations system. Can I just add one other thing? I, I, I agree very strongly with that. Uh, I've engaged in a lot of discussions with the Scandinavian countries where unions are much stronger than they are uh, even in Australia. And uh, they're, the, Scandinavian, oh, okay, the Scandinavian countries have been very innovative, very dynamic. And uh, part of the, the story that they believe, at least many of the economists in, in the Scandinavian countries believe, of their success is strong industrial protection, uh, strong unions, and uh, strong social systems of social protection. And there are two ways that it has, they believe, uh, benefited their growth. So it's been a pro-growth, and it's not just social protection. Uh, at least two or three ways that it has benefited their economy. One of them is, actually that the uh, uh, effect of these policies has been what you call wage compression, moving wages at the bottom up. And that's incentivized companies to become more productive, uh, to try to think about how they use labor more efficiently. So it's actually, you know, we were talking about productivity. These policies are pro-productivity policies. They, they, they motivate firms to think about ways of using labor more efficiently. And, and so there's a positive uh, productivity cycle. The second thing is that when you have better systems of social protection, people can undertake better risk. And innovation is, is risky. But if you have good systems of social protection, you know that if you lose, you're still part of, a, a, of an economy in which even the bottom does reasonably well. So that really encourages uh, more, more risk taking. And finally, I, I don't know, if, uh, some of you may have, uh, have seen some of the uh, uh, debate that, that uh, some of my remarks made, uh, uh, instigated on, <laughs> on, on where, where the government spokesman uh, said that investing in poor people was a waste of money. And it was really quite astounding uh, uh, statement. Uh, they, uh, I view it as an investment, you know, that, that money goes, in the, the worst problem is poverty, childhood poverty. And if children grow up in poverty, they're likely to be less productive in the future. And uh, the, therefore, your growth is going to be weaker. Uh, and if you don't have adequate nutrition, adequate health, but also adequate income, it just affects the whole generational uh, productivity of society. So I view those, those investments, those welfare expenditures, which as you say are, mean, you know, are targeted, but they're not, they're not living off the hog. I mean, you look at the standard of living they're getting, it's not. Uh, you, no one chooses 
to be at that bottom because of the welfare benefits that they're getting. Uh, I think it's an important part of investment uh, in society. You might have trouble convincing some in the public debate <laughs> of that last point. I don't disagree. I, I'm keen to bring Penny in on this, in a sense, in whatever you'd like to say, but I was interested either on, um, we talked a bit about G versus R and the, the pressure to, to get G up rather than to, rather than to get R down. That might be one place to go. The other is the, the longer term fiscal picture for all of this too. I know you'd happily relieved that What if I wasn't going to ask either now. of them? <laughs> is that, does it or you can say whatever trial? you like. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what the, the, the sort of niceties of asking one economist about another economist and, and asking you about Piketty are. But actually, I wanted to come back to the, I suppose, the what is the prescription or what are the what is the direction? So uh, as, you know, certainly in Australia, we, we have a, a perennial debate as a, as a, you know, a reasonably open, medium-sized economy uh, about what are the domestic policy settings that best enhance equality, growth and opportunity, given that we, we live in a world where there are many market and other globalised globalisation forces beyond our control. Uh, and you've spoken in, the, in response to Jenny and Wayne about some of the things that you would say should be done. But I, I, I wonder if you could amplify that. And the, the, the way I was going to ask it is what would you say, I'm sorry, I don't know how as an Australian to say your hometown, Gary. Gary. Yeah. Gary. Yeah, it is Gary. Yeah, no, it's all I can sound, yeah. yeah. Oh, that was Gary. <laughs> no, but, no, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah w what would you say should have... The, what are the industrial policies to which you referred, I think, in your very first answer, uh, and or other policies that you would say governments of the sort of centre-left persuasion should be looking at to, to, re to manage those, um, those impacts and, and to, I suppose, tool our people, enable our people to, to hook into different opportunities? Sure. Uh, you know, I think one, there's been, a, a, again, a very major change in thinking globally uh, on this issue, just as there has been about inequality. And I mentioned before that it used to be thought that you could only get, reduce inequality at the expense of growth. Now we realize that those are complements, not substitutes. It's a really major change in, in thinking, and I think it's an important point to try to get across. Same thing, industrial policy. It used to be viewed that that was a no-no. Uh, the World Bank and IMF told uh, Korea that they ought to, their comparative advantage was growing rice, and they ought to stick to their knitting. And Korea said, uh, no thank you. <laughs> we want to be a, a prosperous country, we want our people to be prosperous, and doing, just letting the market do it, let a, a specializing in rice was not, going to, uh, was not going to do the trick. And so they promoted industrial policies that led to uh, incomes per capita increasing eightfold, OE Korea being in the OECD, one, you know, the 12th largest economy in the world, you, know, you probably all drive some Korean cars, they're a major chip producer. You know, it really worked, very, very successful. Um, now the World Bank has changed its position on this issue. And so from going in opposition to industrial policies, the chief economist of the World Bank over the last five years, that was the major thrust, trying to get countries to have industrial policies. The important point to realize is that every country has industrial policies whether they know it or not. Uh, the only difference is some don't know it. And if you don't know it, your industrial policy is prey to special interest and rent seeking. So for instance, every country has to decide whether you, where you're going to build roads. You were talking about your example of a road. Where you build that road is going to affect your town and the other town. Whether you have ports or where you build those ports, how you build the roads. Uh, it used to be in Africa, they would build a road that only went to the mine. So the roads and the railroads had minimal developmental impacts. It wasn't inevitable. It was an industrial policy that said, let's design a transportation system that did not impact the rest of the development because we want to keep them as colonies and keep them poor to keep our labor costs low. It was almost a deliberate. I, mean, I don't know if they went through that reasoning, but it was almost that bad. In the United States, we had an industrial policy that said, when I use the word industrial policy, what I mean is a policy that pushes some sector of the economy or another. Our bankruptcy law, most countries with, or I would say, reasonable bankruptcy law say, if a debtor can't pay all his debts, 
Who has first claim? It's workers, because workers can't get the labor back. You know, there's no collateral. There's no way you can get repaid. They spent their time. They have nothing else to depend. And the rule of law is supposed to protect those who can't fend for themselves. What did the US do? The first claimant are derivatives. The bankers changed the law so that if a company couldn't pay its debt, the first claimant are those risky products that one company, AIG, got $150 billion more money than we gave to poor people over a decade. <laughs> now, you know, we have corporate welfare, but not welfare for poor people. So um, uh, that was an example of an industrial policy. It worked. We got a big financial sector, 8% <laughs> of GDP. Yeah. So we succeeded. Industrial policy worked. And we, we deliberately set out to encourage an overbloated financial sector. And when I say we, that is to say the financial sector set out to do it. We weren't aware of this as industrial policy. And we wound up with structuring our economy for creating a, an unstable financial system. So in my mind, what we should have done a little bit. UK has done a couple examples of this kind of industrial policy. Norway is an interesting country, you know, very successful in uh, uh, managing its natural resources, one of the few countries with a lot of natural resources that has not suffered from the natural resource curse. It's reinvested the money in its people. Uh, the prime minister uh, of, of Norway, uh, a very dynamic uh, woman, uh, told me a, uh, a meeting last year. She said, you know, now we get more return from our investments in women than we get from oil. Uh, whether it's true or not, it's an important <laughs> story that, that, no, I mean, she really believed yeah. it. And, yeah. I, you know, I, how you actually estimate that is sure. very difficult. Yeah. But, but it's part of their understanding of what investments can do. And that oil is now not the most important source of, the, of their economy. It's investments in people. But they have an active industrial policy to say, how can we take advantage of what our oil industry to support other industries. Um, and they've done that. You know, to, make oil, to, to, to have an oil industry, you have to have pumps. But pumps are used all over in lots of other industries. So they've become a major producer of pumps for every industry now in the world. So that's an example of industrial policy uh, that is very successful. What the UK did uh, that we should have done in, in Gary, whether they could have done it or not, I don't know. But take Manchester, which was the textile capital of the world couldn't compete against Chinese textiles. And they reconverted Manchester into a, a university city, a city of music. Um, not music that I like, but, <laughs> but it's music that has attracted, that makes, it, it's, it's a big source of, of, of revenue. People go there to enjoy that particular kind of music. So these are all examples of re, of restructuring cities that can make them uh, continue to live. It's a huge waste of, of you, you've made these enormous investments in, in urban infrastructure. And to say, oh, I'm sorry, uh, we're just going to let that <laughs> uh, decay and rebuild somewhere else is, you know, it, it may be in some cases that may be the best answer. But in most cases, it's probably not. Uh, I, I want to bring in someone who's possibly got more sympathy for the Manchester sound than, than you do, Joe. Tim uh, Watts. Uh, <laughs> Tim Watts, who, you, I mean, you represent, an, uh, you represent an electorate or constituency with a big industrial heritage and obvious transition challenges now. And at the same time, your own professional experience in IT and technology gives you a particular outlook there. You know, what we're hearing often is the challenge is that the technology is taking the jobs away and isn't giving them back, maybe not anywhere, certainly not in the communities where they're destroying them. What, how are you seeing that on the ground in, in the West? Well, I should start by saying that I, I represent an electorate that's just lost 2,500 jobs in our auto manufacturing industry after yeah. the government moved away from industrial policy in that respect. So that's a bit of a raw wound mm. for me. Um, but I suppose uh, if I have one question, I should re retreat to my area of expertise in technology. Um, and 
you know, I'm very passionate about technology. I love it. It's one of these industries that you know, is disrupting industries and disrupting markets around the world. But it, it does worry me at the same time because I very much agree with Wayne's comments about the strength of our industrial relations system and driving equality in Australia. But then I looked at the technology sector and the, the, most, the biggest impact that it's had is in eroding transaction costs. So that the things that, uh, that unite us, um, so it's atomised uh, the industries that it's gone through, it's atomised employment in those industries, um, it's made uh, a lot of uh, industries more contestable to, to markets for employment and things like that. And I see that and I worry about the, the potential for the industrial relations system that has served us so well to protect us in this new uh, at atomised employment environment. So I suppose I'd ask you uh, what kind of uh, prescriptions can you suggest moving into that world? Do you buy that, that analysis to start with? Secondly, what we, can we do about it? And thirdly, does that mean we need to be looking more at sort of these pre-distribution type interventions? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm particularly interested in intellectual property in this respect as a set of rules that determine who gains from in investments in these sectors. Is this something we need to be looking at uh, in this new world? Yeah, uh, let me, th these are really uh, complex questions, but let, let me first make a couple observations about the high tech sector in the United States and then uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the specific questions. Um, it is a real worry about whether the high tech sector will create enough jobs. Uh, that I think that while it um, will create some jobs. Uh, there is a real worry about whether it will be enough. Just to give you one example, the largest capitalized firm in the United States uh, today is Apple. But Apple has only 49,000 employees in the entire country, of which all but 19,000 are low-paid retail workers. They're only, not, you know, when I say low paid, probably lower than your minimum wage or at your minimum wage. So they're really not what we call great jobs. I and mean, you say every job is good, but these are not the jobs that will create a middle class society. So there are only 19,000 uh, that would be ca categorized. That's not a basis of an economy, uh, you know, a an economy with 350 million people. Uh, what's particularly uh, disturbing about Apple is that it you took advantage, it wouldn't exist without the internet, without modern technology, perfectly willing to take from the technology, the technological investments the government have made, but totally uninterested in, interested in paying back. So it used all the ingenuity that it had used to make telephones with nice round corners brilliant innovations um, to uh, um, avoid paying taxes. Or to cut corners. And to cut corners, <laughs> exactly, to cut corners. Uh, didn't do anything illegal. They have very good lawyers to make sure they don't go to prison. Uh, but do, taking advantage of every loophole in every country. So they claim that all this profits originated in a few hundred people in Ireland, and that they then happened to be able to take advantage of a loophole in Irish tax law, so they didn't even have to pay taxes in Ireland. So, I mean, it, it, I think it's a, so, it, it's a really a moral scandal, uh, and, and went on to recognize that. And I think it's important for the G20 to try to take strong actions to stop this, this race to the bottom, and the, the companies that are willing to take out not to put back. Uh, the second point is from a, a uh, global technology point of view. I mean, you look at where America has been most successful in technology, uh, besides Apple, which has been, you know, Google, Facebook. What are the business models that they're based on? Advertising. We've created the most efficient advertising agencies in the world, and they've become the largest firms in the world. But you cannot have an economy that just advertises other people's products. You know, it's nice to have efficient advertising so that when you're driving, uh, the car, the, the, they can recognize your car and tell you what you ought to be buying. 
uh, or that when you walk by a store, your phone tells you, uh, go in there and, and uh, buy something. But the bottom line is, all this advertising doesn't increase productivity, doesn't even increase spending. It only says, I spend more on this guy rather than that guy. Your spending is going to be limited to your income. So it's all, I don't want to say socially wasteful, but it's not really socially productive. So we have to understand that the innovation in our economy in the United States, for the most part, has not been really increasing our standard of living. Uh, it's been creating more, oh, you, uh, hard to know where, where you create social media in terms of standard of living, but, but uh, uh, not making things like better solar panels or, or, or new products that would uh, change. Um, third thing, um, the, we're going through a, a structural transformation that's analogous to the, the transformation that uh, we went through 100 years ago. 100 years ago, 70% of the people were in agriculture. 70% of people were in agriculture. Today, only 2%, 3% in the United States are in agriculture, and they produce more food than even an obese society can consume. And uh, we, then we had to move from agriculture to manufacturing. Markets don't do that very well, for a very good reason, that the people in those sectors see the value of their assets disappear. So they can't make the investments they need to move to the new sectors. And so they get trapped in the old sectors. And we're a little bit in that same situation, manufacturing. It, we, we're now moving from manufacturing to a service sector. People in the manufacturing with those skills are trapped and they can't go on to the new sectors. Now, what, the only thing that really facilitated that movement from, from agriculture to manufacturing was government. Mm -hmm. In the United States, it was the war, the GI Bill that educated everybody for the manufacturing economy that moved the U.S. from a rural economy to a manufacturing economy. Without the government, it would not have happened. It was a kind of industrial policy. And now we've got to have to go from industrial manufacturing to a service sector. This relates to the question of productivity. Globally, we've been very successful in manufacturing, just like we were in agriculture. Output of manufacturing continues to go up, but globally, employment is going down. And vast countries like the United States, Australia, are going to get inevitably, even if they're the most uh, uh, efficient, are going to get a smaller share of that global employment. And so employment in manufacturing will go down. And then I have to ask the question, where where do you want to go? It can go down faster if you don't do the right policies. Uh, but the question is to try to have a smooth transition. Now, to give you an example, the United States saved the automobile industry. And we're celebrating that. But we saved it in a way that converted what were good paying jobs, paying $45 an hour, to pay the, the wages now in the automobile industry are $15 an hour equivalent to your minimum wage jobs. We could have transformed the industry in some other ways to make it high tech, but we didn't do that. So the bottom line is that, that the, new sect, the new jobs are almost surely going to be in service sector. I mean, you have a huge demand from, for education, not only for Australians, but for Chinese and Indians, who, you know, uh, uh, for health, for, you know, there are lots of these service sector jobs that are not just domestic, which are export potential. I just want to bring in a, a particular question. I, I was struck, you just mentioned the war and the GI Bill. I'm struck that the, the war, the war had, a, had that kind of almost practical impact, with all those policies that arose from it, but it created a, a really powerful moral collectivism in a society. Um, that saw the benefits of working together to do something amazing and important and then thought, well, that's something we can do for other things. Um, and that's, you know, kind of faded. It's clearly faded in, in a different, you know, and it had lots of costs, of course, that 
you know, popular moral culture of the 1950s has, has downsides as well. But there's this very strong moral unity almost in a sense that unity and collective action works and is not just technically sound but is, is a good. And a lot of what we've been talking about here kind of circles around the, the relationship between the politics and the economics. You know, we're hearing some, some of the bad economic policies didn't arise because of technical misunderstandings, they arose because of deliberate, deliberate policies. I, just with that connection in mind, I wanted to bring in a particular question uh, from, uh, from Simon Quinn from Sydney, who, um, who is speaking of the disruptive effects of technology as a supporter of the Chifley Research Centre, who, uh, who was able to email in a question and won a contest to ask you a, a question on behalf of our uh, thousands of supporters. So, uh, Simon, you had a, a question which I think relates to some of this. Uh, yes, I do. Um, although when I received that call, I was um, I thought, somebody must have a better question than me. But, uh, <laughs> So be kind to me. Um, Australia is a technological country. Uh, we have a stable political environment, regardless of who's in power. Uh, we have a educated workforce and abundant natural resources. In that context, my question was, uh, why does poverty exist? But having listened to you, perhaps the better question would be, will we ever eliminate poverty? <laughs> okay, well, there, there are, uh, partly this is a definitional question. I mean, of course you can go back to the Bible, the poor we, you always will have with you, but, but there's a definitional question. There's always gonna be somebody at the bottom. Uh, you know, there's always gonna be some inequality. We're, we're, we're never gonna eliminate inequality, and that's not, one shouldn't confuse what I said, that we have too extreme inequality with the statement that we want complete equality. The two are very different statements, that we have really extreme inequality. The same thing, if you ask, will we always have somebody who has an income, say, less than half the median? You always, almost surely will. But you don't have to have people who are living in deprivation. And that's, that's the difference. You know, to try to say, and deprivation is going to be a relative concept, but there is within any society a, a sense of what are our basic standards. No one has to go without health care. No one should, no child should, you know, nobody should go without adequate nutrition. Uh, probably without some level of adequate housing. You know, what that level is will probably, if you become wealthier, that, that minimum standard may go up. There's still going to be, you know, uh, you wouldn't, might not want to live in the kind of housing you provide at the, at the bottom, but there should be nobody who is really suffering from extreme deprivation in our society. Where I think, uh, progressives ought to particularly focus on, though, is childhood deprivation. Because you might say, you know, if somebody decides they don't want to work, they want to, you know, be a ski bum, or that's their decision. But children don't choose their parents. In the United States, almost one out of four children live in families in poverty. Uh, that shouldn't exist in a, in a, in a well-off country. And you were describing the characteristics of Australia. One of, the, one of the most disturbing things about natural resource rich countries, you probably heard of the paradox of the natural resource curse, that countries with a lot of resources typically don't grow as fast, and you're an exception, and, and, and Norway is are exceptions. It's also the case that you would have thought that countries with a lot of natural resources should have more equality or should have no poverty. Because after all, who owns the natural resources? The people do. And if you tax savings and labor, people might not save as much, might not work as much. If you tax iron ore or oil, the iron ore doesn't say, I'm gonna get really mad at you, I'm gonna to go to another country. <laughs> uh, the oil doesn't go on strike, all right? Okay. It's there. And so, my view is you ought to be taxing, taxing these natural resources at 100%. Uh, when I say you, you ought to get 100% of the, 
of what we call the natural resource rent. Uh, that those rents belong to the people. Now, that says, what do we mean by the rent? It's the value of the resource minus the efficient cost of extraction. And everything else ought to go to the people. It seems, it seems obvious uh, that, that that ought to be the case. Your previous government attempted to move in that direction. Not surprisingly, those who own those natural resources, I mean, you know, who are making the, those ranks, were not enthusiastic about <laughs> uh, that particular move. You get a Nobel Prize in understatement. <laughs> <laughs> um, but from an economic point of view, it was absolutely the right thing to do. And uh, you, you should understand that uh, your attempts to do so have really inspired other countries, even though you might say you've learned a hard political lesson. Um, Israel uh, had uh, let its, uh, leased its oil offshore, oil and gas fields offshore, to an American company um, at, I won't say whether there was corruption or not, but at royalties that were uh, unjustifiable, unjustifiably low. Um, this is a really uh, interesting case because, not surprisingly, uh, the U.S. government ambassador tried to put pressure on the uh, Israeli government not to renegotiate those. And I had to make some speeches about governments, the U.S. government not intervening in, in activities of other countries on behalf of oil, mining companies to embarrass them to, to back off on that, on that particular effort. The net result of this was that the Israeli parliament passed legislation that basically, uh, you might say, renegotiated the contracts <laughs> and increased the royalties uh, multiple fold. I feel Wayne Swan has something to add to this discussion. <laughs> do you want, um, do you want, yeah, just pass it, Linda. Do you want to pass it? Thanks. Well, tempting as it is to talk about resource <laughs> rents, I won't, but the question is a bit related to this, and that is, where do you see the sources of global growth coming from, particularly in the developed world? We know growth will be driven by the developing world, we know it'll be driven by China and Indonesia, but what I see as I move around is that there's a lot of cashed up companies, and they're not using that cash to invest in long-term productivity enhancing, capacity enhancing investments, which will drive global growth. A lot of that cash is being used to invest in speculative activity. Uh, you know, the London property market, the list goes on. What policies do you see in the developed world that can further encourage these pools of capital to be productively invested for the long term in a job creating way, rather than diverted, uh, particularly by rent seekers who are, who are seeking to avoid their fair of tax, their fair share of tax, particularly say in mining? Uh, what sort of policies do you think? that we need more of in developed countries to make sure that this capital goes to long-term growth enhancing investments rather than short-term speculative capital gain. You mentioned profit shifting, that's certainly one of them, but there are many, there are many others. Yeah, so uh, let me uh, mention something else that your uh, previous government did right, I thought, uh, but which was not always uh, as politically popular. I think one of the real growth industries is uh, going to be uh, uh, renewable energy. Uh, that climate change is a reality and that we are beginning to appreciate it more and more. And let me say, it's not just global warming, it's weather variability. Uh, and uh, the, the cost of this is enormous. Uh, we've you know, recently studied done in you know, at US. Originally, the climate change the debate in the United States, the United States had some ambivalence because uh, the South in the United States uh, would have suffered a great deal, but Minnesota would have become more livable. And so there was a trade-off, and most people were saying, let the South go, and, and the really important part of the country would actually be better <laughs> off. So there was a debate about whether we would benefit from, climate, from global warming or not. We now realize that that's totally wrong way of phrasing it. The cost to the U.S. of the weather variability has been absolutely enormous. Already. 
uh, already, mm -hmm. and, and it will get worse. So um, I think that, that being ahead of the game is really important. And if you had a carbon price, it would motivate firms to invest, and this, if we had a global carbon price, even more so, to invest in retrofitting the economy. The whole global economy has to be retrofitted to reflect the new scarcity that we hadn't fully appreciated before. So that, that's one very important uh, area. From uh, the point of view of, of uh, you know, th this is not just uh, new energy creating, uh, new, new, new uh, uh, electricity generators. We're talking about redesigning our cities. We're talking about uh, redesigning our buildings. It's a really big project that we ought to be engaged in. And that, that would be an enormous source of demand for investment that would really be, a, a, I think, a key uh, provider of growth. So again, it's not that we ought to wait until recovery to begin this agenda. This could be an important part of the recovery agenda, the economic recovery, uh, economic recovery agenda. Uh, there are lots of other investments in technology. Uh, it is quite striking that I think, you know, going back to the question about technology, we've been drawing down the pool of basic research. If you look at a lot of the innovations, they're really putting into place advances that occurred 20, 30, 40 years ago. The number of new, to take pharmaceuticals, the number of basic new drugs has almost dropped to zero. And, uh, and you see that, you know, all the old drugs are, are coming off patent and nothing replacing them uh, except occasionally an evergreening of an old patent, but not new ideas. So, so I think um, in terms of, of a growth strategy, I think we ought to be investing more in basic research. And you can't tell where that's going to go, but it's very clear in the past that that basic research has generated lots of new ideas that have led to new investments. And that's fine if you're a privately owned company, but companies that are out there that are uh, looking at the share market, they're, they're seeking to pursue strategies which inflate their share price in the short term, which lead them away from the long-term investment strategies that are needed. So what do you think are the ch policy changes that are required uh, oh, to, to encourage those people away from their short-term speculative behavior to long-term investment. So I, th I think there are two policy changes. One is uh, there are some important changes in corporate governance. And corporate governance now f encourages a focus on short-termism. And there are some interesting ideas that some of my colleagues at Columbia have been working on called loyalty shares, where voting rights in corporation are in proportion to how long you hold the shares. If you're, if, if you're a short-term investor, you have relatively little say. If you're a long-term investor, you have a lot more uh, say. So I think that would be a change in governance, corporate governance, which would signal that we believe that long-term investment is really what people, firms ought to be thinking about, not their quarterly returns. A second thing that would complement that is uh, a financial transactions tax, because much of the activity that goes on in the financial market is a game. You know, when you're betting, you know, uh, whether the stock market is going up, you win, I lose. It's a zero-sum game. It isn't really all that short-term trading doesn't enhance the productivity of our economy. Now, in the United States, we've taken that to an extreme, and I don't know where Australia is. I don't, uh, what? Folly. Uh, but this flash trading is, uh, 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 I have argued, I have a paper that I've, I, I gave at the uh, Federal Reserve in Atlanta, uh, arguing that that has negative effects on our economy, not just zero, but negative. Because basically what these flash trading are doing are very sophisticated front running. 
And uh, what that means is that those who really do the investment in long term thinking, you know, where is the steel industry going to go? Where is this industry going to go? As soon as they figure it out, the flash traders can get their information, beat them, take out their profits. And so it under it, it, it takes away the profits from people who are trying to think long term. So that's why I think a financial transaction tax is really important. Chris, do you, I mean, you're, you're in boardrooms. You're talking to people and trying to, in, in part, you know, revive some, some stronger connections there for us. Is there an appetite in, in parts of business or, in, or, a, or a growing appetite or an awareness in Australia that there's benefits uh, for, for the economy as a whole and benefits for shareholders and benefits for owners in, in a more enlightened version of self-interest for them? Yeah, I think there is. I think there is. Um, obviously, it's patchy. Um, <laughs> uh, but there are, there are some deep thinkers in the corporate world yeah. who, um, without going through names, yeah, who, sure. who, who could, could very well look and easily engage in this conversation, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be the, about the tax base mm -hmm. and their, their belief that either individually or in a corporate fashion they should be paying more, or about the importance of innovation and investment in renewable energy and, the, and how a market-based mechanism is the right approach mm -hmm. for environmental reasons but also for economic reasons, as Joseph so eloquently outlined. So I, I do believe that there is some potential there in the Australian context at least, uh, for that conversation to be had with corporate Australia. Mm. Let me just c comment on that. Uh, uh, Davos, every year, they, they do a survey of what are the business leaders think mm -hmm. are the major issues. And in recent years, the, number, the two top issues have pretty consistently been climate change and inequality. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if these issues are not part of their mindset. Now, these are mostly European uh, business leaders, not American business leaders. And there is a difference between business leaders in the two, and, and uh, Australia is somewhere in between, I think. Uh, uh, but at least uh, there, are, there are a lot of, of business leaders who, who, who really would understand much of what we would say, but they would also say, our hands are tied under the current framework. Sure. I have to do certain things because of you know, I have a responsibility to my shareholders. If we could change the legal framework, then I would uh, have to behave differently. But under the current framework, uh, uh, we're induced to behave in ways that we think are not in the long range for us. Now, um, under the current framework, I'm induced to behave in a certain way, which is to, um, to release you in part to, uh, to do some other um, activities in Canberra. But I know that. You know, there's a group of people who would love to have a bit of a chance to shake hands and have a cup of tea yeah, sure. and have a cookie even. Okay. Um, uh, and we've got, if we, if we finish now, we've got a few minutes for people to have the opportunity to do that. Um, I do want to um, just thank you so much. I mean, it's a real masterclass for us. Um, in, part, in part, somewhat reassuring um, for those of us who, who worked in the, in the former government or for those of us who supported the policies pursued by the former government and for those of us involved in the revival of the, the next progressive government in Australia. It gives us some hope that we didn't get it all wrong, um, but, uh, which not everyone seems to believe. But, um, but also just some really fascinating insights into what's going on in the, in the world and some new thinking. We've got something for you to take home. Um, some classic Australian children's literature for your <laughs> grandchildren. Um, I, I, I couldn't think of an economic biography that I could give you without embarrassing myself. So instead, you've got a book about okay. Geelong Bazoo. Uh, a book about an adolescent girl looking for Ella Brandy, a great story about aspiration and education, and Seven Little Australians, which is a, a story about misrule. <laughs> so <laughs> so, thank so you. we're just so grateful. Thank you, okay. Chris, as well, and thank Pleasure. you all. And please stay around for a few minutes and introduce yourselves. Thank you.